Okay, we are going to start. We good to go? So my name is Dan Fleisch. I'm an emeritus professor here. I'm not sure what that means other than I receive no paycheck ever. <laughs> I'm also the director of the observatory. I don't know what that means other than I'm the only guy who cleans the restroom in the observatory. <laughs> so you're probably thinking we're going to go get some observing done tonight about the weather forecasts. Well, they're dueling. One says it's going to be clearing up right now. The other one says it's going to clear up sometime after 2 a.m. We don't know. But if you don't get to look through the telescope or see uh, Dean's tour of the sky tonight, we are going to have uh, other opportunities for you, not with Dean, but with a poor substitute. <laughs> and uh, in the next five weeks, as a matter of fact, every Sunday you will have a chance to look at the sun safely through a, an appropriate filter because we're coming up to this gigantic thing that you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, the total solar eclipse, which comes right here through Springfield, where we're going to have two hours, two hours, that would be nice, two minutes and 40 seconds of totality, as it's called. Leading up to that, next Sunday, I'm giving a talk at 1 p.m. in the observatory about galaxies. The next Sunday, 1 p.m. in the observatory about stars. The next Sunday, I think we're up to the 24th, 1 p.m. about planets. And the next Sunday, the 31st, anybody know what the 31st is? Easter Sunday. I'm going to talk about the church in the cathedral, which is the church in the cathedral, the cathedral, the observatory, the cathedral as an observatory. They used cathedrals as observatories hundreds of years ago because they cared about where the sun was because you know how to set the date of Easter. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So they needed to know the motion of the sun. So I'm going to talk all about that on Easter Sunday, 1 p.m. Then the next week, we all know, April 8th, that's going to be the eclipse, which you will hear about tonight. So a lot going on here on campus. We're installing a giant solar system. It's going to have a three-foot sun. And then everything scaled in size and in distance all the way through campus. I miscalculated. It didn't fit on campus. Saturn's going to be at the Art Museum, in the Springfield Art Museum. Uranus is going to be at the... Uh, downtown main library, Clark County main library, and Pluto and Neptune are both going to be at the Westcott house. So if you want to see, so there's going to be a planetary information station along with the planet, some other things going on. So we got a lot in, in uh, advance of the eclipse as well as on eclipse day. That's not why you're here tonight. You're here to hear this guy. This is Dean Regis. It's not an overstatement to say he has influenced my life in positive ways at least twice. Uh, that's because I, I um, used to watch him quite a bit late at night on PBS when they would uh, have a guy come on and talk about the sky, like two, two minutes, one minute, very quick. I just loved it. And it, it, it made me realize people don't always need three hours of class time all about the details of thermonuclear fusion. Sometimes they just want to know what the heck is that bright light in the sky and maybe a little more. So he did that. He's done a lot of things like that for 23 years. Dean was, was the uh, outreach astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory. So he has done more of this kind of thing than I and probably 10 other people like me will ever do in our lives. The most recent time he affected my life was just a few, about uh, two and a half years ago, when I saw that he had been the astronomer in residence at the Grand Canyon. Who's been to the Grand Canyon? Were you there at night? <laughs> Half the park is after dark. Who said that? I don't know. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Notice the background. And he was so positive and so effusive about his experience there. I thought, wow, maybe I could do that. And then I realized, wait, what are the chances they're going to have another person from southwestern Ohio come as another astronomer in residence? But then I thought, wait a minute, he's so good, they're probably going to be anxious to have another person from Southwest Ohio. Sure enough, so I did that for two months at the end of 1922, and then I went back last August for another, another three weeks. So if you haven't seen the night sky over the Grand Canyon, you must do this. This is a bucket list item. So put that on your schedule. If you happen to have a trip schedule there, and I'm not going to be there or Dean's not there, by all means, let me know. I will see if there is an astronomer in residence while you're going to be there, and if so, I'll put in a good word for you and let you know what's going on there. All right. So uh, other things Dean has done. I hate it when people giving introductions have to read, but he's done so much, I have to read. 
So I mentioned that he was the outreach astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory for 23 years. He also writes books. You'll have a chance to purchase some of those right up here. You can see things like how to teach grown-ups about Pluto, thousand facts about space, a thousand things to see in the night sky. Those are really worthwhile things for you to experience so that you can help your kids or your grandkids or other people appreciate this natural phenomenon that is available in decreasing quantities to all of us all the time. I say that because of light pollution, which is another topic that we will cover at another time. He's also a contributing ed editor at Sky and Telescope, a magazine read both by amateur astronomers and professional astronomers. One minute on amateur. Amateur does not mean somehow lower quality or unprofessional. All it means is it comes from Latin amo, to love. Amateur astronomers do astronomy because they love it, not because somebody is paying them to do it. So that, that does not comment on the quality of their instruction or their experience at all. So at any rate, uh, I strongly recommend magazines like Sky and Telescope. Another one that tends to specialize in really beautiful pictures is called Astronomy Magazine. You can find these at bookstores if you can find a bookstore. <laughs> OK. Uh, I know, online, right? Uh, he's also a frequent uh, guest on national radio shows such as uh, Science Friday, Here and Now, does his own podcasts as well. Uh, just truly a uh, remarkable individual. Has a BA in history from Xavier and an MA in secondary education. Dean Regas. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everybody coming out here today. Uh, this is a momentous month. What is going to happen on April 8th is truly incredible. Are you all pumped? <laughs> Are you sufficiently pumped? <laughs> well, if you're not, I'm hoping by the end of this you will be, and even then you still won't be, because a total solar eclipse is literally the most amazing thing you'll ever see in your entire life. Get ready. Because you may think, all right, it's just going to be a sky show. We're going to see some you know, darkness. And the, you know, you'll see this little picture here that looks like this. And you're like, yeah, OK, it's going to be pretty cool. No. <laughs> it's going to be life-altering, mind-blowing. Now, what I mean by this is you may have moments in your life where you think we're really special. But they're not going to hold a candle to this. Birth of your kids, nothing. <laughs> Wedding day, garbage. <laughs> you will push your bride aside to look at this. This is incredible. And there's nothing that I can do to prepare you for what's going to actually happen when you're actually going to see it. Because it is indescribable. Yet, I'm still going to try and describe it. <laughs> And to describe it, when you have a total eclipse, when the sun is eclipsed completely by the moon, it is powerful. So this is the scene. You're outside, sunny day, and all of a sudden, this shadow sweeps across the land. And you look up at where the sun was, it's gone. Replaced by a black hole with these wispy clouds, the corona of the sun around the outside. The sky gets darker. It turns a silver purpley color like you've never seen before. You see stars in the middle of the daytime. The temperature drops 20 degrees. Wow. The animals think it's nighttime. Crickets start chirping, birds come out, and most importantly, the people next to you go absolutely bonkers. <laughs> Rational people that were next to you turn into raving lunatics, yelling, screaming, crying, speechless, waving their arms. They, it is scary. It is fun. It is awe-inspiring. It is all that wrapped up in one. And in a few short minutes, the sun comes back out. Everything slowly returns back to normal. And you're left wondering, did that even happen? It's weird. It is also addictive. So, get ready. Now, 
Did I just lay that on a little thick? <laughs> Not much. I'm pr it's pretty much close. This is going to be really cool. So I'm very excited to be talking about this um, because, uh, oh, by the way, you don't even have to go anywhere. Like it's going to be right here. And I'm in Cincinnati where it's not going to be. And so that's why you all should feel special because the last time a total solar eclipse happened in Cincinnati was the year 1395. And the next one's going to be the year 3046. And you guys get it this time. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, so I'm very excited about this. This is a date I've had on my calendar for a long time. But, uh, you know, it is, it is our Super Bowl. It's the Astronomer Super Bowl, but it's also everybody's Super Bowl. Because this is a guaranteed so cool event that if it's clear, and you can see this, it is a life changer. Like, I hear a lot of uh, uh, you know, th things about, oh, on the internet, like, oh, this great meteor shower is happening, or this great comet is up in the sky, and they usually disappoint. This won't disappoint, there's no doubt. So all we need is a clear sky. That's, of course, important. But um, so, uh, yeah, I've been doing astronomy for a long time. I, you know, this is, uh, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Fleisch mentioned about amateur. Uh, it, is, it is a passion of mine. I mean, being an astronomer is my lifestyle. I would do it for free. I would, uh, well, of course, I get to travel too, but that's nice. But um, I would do this because I really love it. And it, uh, it, it, it kind of got a hold of me. I was, I was uh, graduated from college with a bachelor's, with a history degree, and I was going to teach high school history. Did my student teaching, and I didn't want to teach high school history. <laughs> and so I found astronomy as a part-time job working at a planetarium where they put the stars up on the ceiling and I just fell in love instantly like I knew it right away and so I dove in and learned all that I could about this and so now 25 years later I still I, I mean like people are like uh, I, I talk to them like I'm a, like I'm a kid or something like that and so like I just gave a talk to uh, fifth graders at a school down in Cincinnati and you would be surprised because I don't think you could separate me from a fifth grader. <laughs> like, and they come up to me and like have all these questions like, Mr. Regan, do you know about this? I'm like, yeah, I know about that. It's really cool, isn't it? They're like, yeah, what about this galaxy? Yeah, I know about this. Like, it's so I'm like, it's, so it keeps me young. That's for sure. Uh, so uh, I, I'm also a host of a podcast called Looking Up. So wherever you get your podcast, check that out. We have new episodes every two weeks. And we interview guests from around the astronomy world, astronauts, authors. Uh, most recent interview I did that's coming out soon is with Andrian. She is the widow of Carl Sagan, who also produced a lot of the Cosmos series. Talk about a passionate person about astronomy. She was really good. Uh, and I also just interviewed Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, who was fun to talk to as well. And so check that out if you get your podcasts. And then I'm the author of six books, including 100 Things to See in the Night Sky, 1,000 Facts About Space, and my controversial How to Teach Grown-Ups <laughs> About Pluto. So uh, I just have to ask, since I need to know my audience, how many of you are still mad about what we did to Pluto? <laughs> just checking, just checking who I need to watch out for. Because, you know, just to put it in perspective, this was 17 and a half years ago. <laughs> So, you know, you might want to let it go. <laughs> so I wrote this book for kids. It's a guidebook because kids, by and large, don't care. Uh, and they are tired of hearing you talk about when you were a kid and Pluto was a planet. They're tired of hearing that. So I wrote this book, How to Walk Their Traumatized Grown-Ups Through the Loss of a Planet. It does include the five stages of grief illustrated. <laughs> I made sure that was in the book. So uh, I'll have the books available here in the front. You can feel free to check those out uh, at the break and, and see those. Uh, be happy to, uh, if you want to get them, I'm happy to sign them and all that kind of stuff too. So check those out. Okay, so let's get down to it. Eclipse. Now I just talked about the greatest show of uh, an eclipse is a total solar eclipse, but we had an eclipse just a few months ago. October 14th, 2023, we had an eclipse and didn't really make a lot of headlines because it was only a partial eclipse. Only part of the sun was blocked out. But this made it even more special about this one because uh, there's some things that happened in October that 
uh, different than what was going to happen in April. And so what was big difference was this was the maximum eclipse. So that's the moon in front of the sun. So they call this a ring of fire eclipse because the moon is not close enough to the earth to block out the whole sun. And so the moon changes its distance from us. So sometimes it's closer and it looks bigger. Sometimes it's farther and looks smaller. And this one it was smaller, so it didn't quite block out the whole thing. And eclipses like this, you have to be in a certain place to see the ring of fire. They're called the annularity. So I was looking on the maps to see what places could I go. There was Oregon, Utah, New Mexico, Texas. As I look along the path, I'm like, okay, yep, yep, ooh. A certain town struck me in New Mexico, because if you're going to see something spacey, <laughs> you should go to Roswell, don't you think? So I went to Roswell and I saw it. There's me with some of the natives. Uh, they really, they still love that alien stuff. They got alien car washes, alien fast food places, the McDonald's looks like a UFO. And so, uh, yeah, they, they, they might have been humans. I don't know. Um, oh, one little quick aside. I mean, this is what's so fun about when you do eclipse chasing, you travel, you get to meet all sorts of different groups. And so this one, I usually just like write to clubs. And I'm like, oh, Roswell Astronomy Club. I wrote to them. I was like, hey, I was thinking about coming over to see uh, the eclipse with you all. And they wrote back within 10 minutes. They're like, yeah, come see us. Come see us. And, uh, and so they even gave me a telescope to use and all. And it's they're so cool when you get with astronomy groups. They're all very welcoming and open to this. But then I still did have to give them a hard time because uh, <laughs> I, I would say, I, I, I don't know, I probably, they probably didn't get my sarcasm, but I was like, so wait, so uh, tell me about this UFO that crashed. <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, this UFO crashed in 1947. I was like, oh, uh, anything since then? <laughs> and they're like, no. I was like, so just the one. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, okay. That's interesting. Change your whole town just because of that. Anyway, so now this is a picture that I took with my phone of this eclipse. This was just a, my phone attached to a telescope that had a filter on it, and I took that picture. And then it suddenly occurred to me, well, why don't I just do a video? So here's my video. There's the moon in front of the sun. Here we are zoomed in. And at the end of annularity, you see ah. those bumps. Those are mountains on the moon. Captured with my phone through a pretty cheap telescope. And you see these little beads of light. They call that Bailey's beads. That's the light of the sun coming through the valleys of the moon at the end and the beginning of the eclipse. And this was so cool. Like people are like, oh, you know, total eclipse is so much better and all that stuff. This was, I mean, I got pretty good chills watching this. This is still really cool to be in that right place at the right time to see something like this. But we got to step it up because we want totality. We want to see this and we want to see the entire sun blocked out. So that was a nice little appetizer for me, but now I'm ready for the real show. So I'm going to go over kind of the basics first of what's going on here. And, you know, you always get to see these kind of graphics of like Earth, Sun, Moon. So this is the lineup, Sun on one side, Earth on the other side, Moon in the middle. I mean, anybody got a problem with this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, as Dan found out when he did his scale model of the solar system and made his sun too big, this is what happens. The sun would have been way too big. Anyway, but, so, but this is essentially what's happened is that the shadow of the, the moon comes down in a little cone shape and just barely touches the earth. So the fineness of this is so perfect. Now you get a partial eclipse every couple of years or so, a partial eclipse of the sun. So here's one at sunset with the sun there, the moon in front of it, taking a little bite of it. So you get this every couple of years or so. But to get them lined up exactly, you have the sun at 93 million miles away, the moon at 240,000 miles away, and they have to be exactly lined up. And so it's pretty hard to get it exactly right. So when I first started doing this way back in like 1999 and 2000, uh, I was looking ahead to these eclipses. And I thought, well, all right, there's three of them in the United States. I'm gonna mark these down. One of them already happened. How many folks saw the total back in 2017? Very good, very good. Then we got the one coming up. And then, other than another one in 
Montana only in 2044. Ooh. That one is the next one. Now I'm a patient guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I have my limits. And I did mark these three on my calendar thinking I'm going to see all three of them. And so one down, two to go. And this one coming up is the, the big close one. Because this is as close as it's going to get to us, basically. The one in 2045 is going to go across the southern United States and will go over my retirement home in Fort Lauderdale. But that's <laughs> beside the point. I want to see this one. Now, uh, to kind of even accentuate how cool this is from where we are and where everything is, this is a scale model of the sun next to the moon. If they, you could put them right next to each other, that's what they look like. Sun, moon. <laughs> So the sun's 400 times the diameter of the moon. How can the moon block it out? Answer? It's closer. How much closer? You're paying attention. You're reading. 400 times closer. Could it be? Yep, sun's 400 times bigger diameter. Sun's 400 times farther away. That means the sun and moon appear like they're the same size in the sky. There's no other place in the solar system where this is. Mars, moon's too small. Jupiter, the other ones, moons are too big. This is the only place where we have this lineup. Sometimes the moon has to be closer to us to block it all the way out. And so, using my best PowerPoint animation, <laughs> here they are lining up perfectly. Oh, very nice. Yeah, this took me, this took me surprisingly a long time. <laughs> I thought, oh yeah, I could figure this out. No, that took me all week, but that's okay, I got it. And now you get it all lined up, you get the moon over the sun, bingo, you get the whole total solar eclipse. So now the thing is, is that the shadow is so small. So the, the line, the path of totality is about 80 to 100 and some miles wide, very small across the, uh, the world, and you have to be in the right place at the right time. So people are eclipse chasers. They will travel to various places around the world to see this. And so this is a satellite picture of one of the total solar eclipses. That's the shadow looking down on Antarctica. Mm. And so the shadow is about 100 miles wide or so. And so people travel to Antarctica to see this. I did not. <laughs> this was back when, well, I didn't want to fork up the $35,000 for this trip to go to Antarctica to maybe see the sun barely eclipse just above the ground. But I did find people that did go that and talk to them, and they shamed me that I should have gone. But uh, when they got to Antarctica, the hill was blocking the view, so they had to climb up the hill as fast as they could, and then even still they eclipsed the eclipse. But that would have been pretty cool to see. Yeah. So one of the fellows that went on this trip, his name is David Levy, he was talking to me about this. He was the discoverer of a comet that ran into Jupiter back in the 90s. And he came to Cincinnati and I was talking to him about this eclipse trip and all this stuff. And, and uh, he said, why didn't you go? I was like, come on, man, $35,000, are you crazy? He's like, well, when are you gonna see one? <laughs> and I said, well, probably 2017, I guess. And this was back in 2004. He looked at me like I was insane. He was like, what? You're gonna wait 13 years? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I can't, we can't all go to Antarctica. He's like, oh, ding, 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 ding. Mm. He shamed me. And he shamed me so bad that I went and saw one before that. 2006 Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so this wasn't that, uh, uh, difficult. You know, <laughs> fly to Athens, go on a cruise around the Mediterranean, go see islands. Yeah, it wasn't rough in it. <laughs> so let me share with you my 5,000 slides. <laughs> no, just kidding, just two. Uh, so we got to tour around the Mediterranean and then park the boat on Eclipse Day. So it was Eclipse Cruise just for that. And so here we are on the back of the boat. Um, by the way, I don't know if uh, I learned this correctly, but for how many folks have done cruises before? Am I correct in saying that the main thing is eating? <laughs> is that what, that's what you do? Is it, you get breakfast, you go walk for a few minutes, go back, then it's lunch. Is that how, that's how it works, right? 
So everybody in the boat, the topic of conversation at, at the meal times were, how many eclipses is this for you? And so people are like, oh, this is my third, this is my fifth, this is my tenth, and then it comes to me, it's my first. And they're like, oh, so cute, I remember my first one. Awesome. And so uh, I was uh, kind of one of the newbies out there, but everybody uh, had, had a little bit of experience. And then, so when it starts, you have the partial stages, which last about an hour and change. So you see the first contact of the moon starting to take a bite out of the sun, and then you got about an hour and a little bit more until totality, which is the longest hour ever because you're waiting and waiting and waiting and trying to figure out when if that cloud is going to get in the way and all this stuff or the boat's going to stop or like, I don't know, everything that you're thinking about could happen. So here you are kicking back and you have to wear those glasses if even a little sliver of sunlight is showing. So you need the eclipse glasses to block out the light during all the other stages. And I was messing around trying to kill some time and so I did some practice with binoculars. And the deal with this is uh, you can let binoculars uh, project an image. You have your, the sun behind you. So you have your back to the sun. Let the sunlight come over your shoulder through the binoculars and down onto the ground and you can make an image. It's a really nice way to do it because then you just focus it with the focuser and you can see sunspots and everything like that. It's a really nice way to do it. So if you have binoculars, try it out. So here's how dark it got at one o'clock in the afternoon uh, during the totality. And you look around and there's just this, this sunset, 360 degrees all around you. Mm. And it's a little darker than twilight. It's not you know, pitch black or anything like that, but the color of the sky is just so strange and so eerie. So no pictures really do it justice, but I did want to play the video, somebody took a video of the totality happening. And on the boat is David Levy. He was the guest celebrity presenter. He was on the PA system and he's giving us the play-by-play -play ahead of the eclipse. So I'm gonna press the play and it's mostly for audio because I want you to hear things. The video is okay, but the audio is much better. And what he's doing is he's telling us all to put our glasses on and look at the partially eclipsed sun then turn away and look at the waves and the shadow coming. You could see the shadow coming. So you're gonna hear that a few times and then we'll get to totality. So, here we go. This is off, look at the shadow coming in the glass. Glasses on. Look at the glasses. Glasses off, look at the shadow coming in. Glasses off, look at the sun. We are now in that's me right there and the horn was probably right there but I I didn't move an inch because I'm there going like this I was speechless I mean it was incredible and I I'm not a hundred percent sure about this but I'm pretty sure is that David Levy he timed it up so good and I think he was early because you're not supposed to look at any of the sun. If any little sliver is showing, I think he went early. Because I saw the last mm -hmm. ray of sunlight coming in at me, and then the whoosh. It was so good. <laughs> so you did not hear this from me. Wait, how am I going to say this? Oh, uh, don't. No, I don't want to say it that way. I was going to say, don't look early. No. Just forget it. Look five seconds early. Just, just do it. Whenever the time the totality is supposed to start, do it five seconds before that. Those five seconds of a little bit of sunlight probably won't hurt you. 
I mean, I can still see, so. Yeah, so have the timing, like, glasses off, see the last five seconds before it. Because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what he did. Because it was pretty cool. So here is the kind of a more accurate picture of, of the darkness and the smallness of the eclipse. So you see those pictures, and it seems big, but it's not really that big. The sun doesn't take up a lot of space in the sky. It's the whole thing. It's the whole scenery. It's the whole vibe altogether. But then looking up there where the sun was, it is tiny. So at that point, you're kind of in this, this limbo state um, and just trying to take this in as much as you can. And so one of the other bits of advice that was given to me on the eclipse cruise, which I will give to you all, uh, and the, one of the real experienced eclipse chasers said, Dean, do not take a picture of it. Hmm. And I was like, well, why not? He's like, because you do not want to waste a second looking down. You don't want to waste a second focusing. Just checking out the exposures because the exposures are tough. You go from bright light to really, really dark, and you're going to have to take 10 seconds to look at your phone to get this or your camera to get the exposures right. And he's like, do not waste a second. Take it all in. And I was like, well, yeah, but I still want a picture. I mean, I, I mean I'm in Greece. Come on, I got to get a picture. And he's like, don't get a picture. And then he said something that I was offended at for about two seconds, but then saw he was right. He said, Dean, any picture you take is going to suck. <laughs> and if at best it doesn't suck, mine is going to be better than yours. And I'll give you mine. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> because that's what he gave me. <laughs> yeah. So this is the diamond ring. This is the last little bit of sunlight coming around the mountains of the moon. So it looks like a ring around it. And this is what I swear David Levy got us to see before it was fully eclipsed, because I remember it very vividly. Uh, and seeing that little bit of sunlight come around for five beats, one, two, three, four, five, and then it's gone. And then you could see, do you see a little pink thing right there? That is an eruption on the sun, a prominence, and you could see it naked eye. I did not see a prominence at the last eclipse, naked eyes, but this one was clear as day. You could see a red little pink eruption on the top of the sun. It was awesome. And then a few moments later, the totality really kicks in. The corona really comes out. And then you start to see these kind of lines in the corona. This is the magnetic field of the sun. So think of like a, a magnet with iron filings with the North Pole and the South Pole. And each eclipse has its own shape to the corona that happens to this. So this was really cool. And then it's just over so fast, so fast. Three minutes, 53 seconds for this one. Sun pops out the other side and it's over. Just like that. <laughs> so, you know what the fifth graders always say? They say, wait, Mr. Regis, you went to Greece for three minutes and 53 seconds? <laughs> I'm like, well, and a vacation. And I always have to tell, uh, uh, you know, well, this was back when I was working, and uh, they said, uh, you know, work paid for this too, so it's like, and I'm like, you know, kids, like when you're in science, they will pay you to go places. <laughs> Do you know that science pays you to go places? Like, oh, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Don't they? I mean, they pay you to go places. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, so I didn't see another one after that. I was thinking about other ones, like in, uh, there was one in Iceland I was looking at, some in Patagonia. None of them were really close until that 2017 one. So I convinced myself that I was just going to wait till 2017. And so this is the one that I saw in Franklin, Kentucky. So not too far, about a three hour drive south from Cincinnati. And I didn't follow that person's advice and I took pictures. Not a very many, but I took some. So I had my filtered telescope. Uh, there's my setup back in 2017 with the filter on my little telescope and my camera down at the bottom. Uh, and so I took a lot of the partial stages quite a bit, and at totality, 
it's difficult because you have to do it very quickly. You have to take the filter off, because with the filter on, you can't see anything. So you have to take the filter off, then take the pictures. And so basically, all I did was shove, picture, 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 picture. That's it. <laughs> so I didn't take very many. But definitely really cool. Not as good as that other guy's pictures, are they? No, they're not. So. Now we gotta get to the part of where you gotta go for this. Because have I sufficiently built this up for you? Yeah. Are you ready to like, well, wait, it's a Monday, yeah. April 8th. Is everybody called in sick? <laughs> if you haven't, <laughs> if you haven't, develop your cough right now or let your, uh, uh, let everybody know you shouldn't go to work. Is school's canceled, I would assume. Is, is Wittenberg canceled? Well, I guess you're in totality. See, the thing is where I am in Cincinnati, we're not in totality. So all the people are debating, what do we do? What do we do? Should we cancel school or should we cancel work to drive somewhere? And I'm like, yes. Uh, but they don't, they're not sure. And so even now, Cincinnati Public Schools has not canceled, even though everybody else has. Dayton, Columbus, Cleveland have all canceled. Cincinnati has not canceled. And I'm just like, boy, well, see ya. I mean, I'm, uh, so you all are great that you are at least in totality, so you don't have to go anywhere. But I want to show you the map. So this is the map that I, I use, and I wish I could share the the, the address easily. It's hard to share. So uh, I'll have it up later and you can come and take a picture of it or something like that. But you do a Google search for interactive eclipse map 2024 and this usually comes up. So you can click and drag anywhere to see the path of totality. So we'll start where it starts. Here in the South Pacific. And so the shadow is going to go between these two red lines. So anywhere between these two places that's where it will be totality. Anywhere outside of that, not totality. The blue line is the center line where it's the maximum length of eclipse. So it'll start in sunrise here in the South Pacific, go across, not across any land. I don't know if that's an island or below <laughs> the ocean, but anyway, let's just keep going. Then it hits Mexico right where Mazatlan is through Texas through Arkansas, through Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Ontario, Quebec, Vermont, Maine, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and then fades out in the Atlantic at sunset. So you gotta be somewhere between those two red lines. So, Cincinnati, for example, mm. not in those two lines. I was just, mm, all right, yeah, I, uh, nah, I won't tell you which school I was at because I don't want to get them in trouble. <laughs> but anyway, let's just say Cincinnati. So let's say you're in downtown Cincinnati, somewhere right around here. Uh, so you can click on any place in the map. It'll tell you when the eclipse will start, how good it'll be, how long it'll be, that kind of thing. And so when I click on that spot, downtown Cincinnati, the sun, obscuration of the sun will be 99.676%. Oh. So 99.676% of the sun will be blocked out. Not good enough. <laughs> it's 100 or nothing. Well, I'll take something, but I, I, I can't think that way. And so it is so close. 99%, it will get a little darker and it will get a little cooler, but you won't quite have the same effects. So, you lucky ducks are up here. Nope, too far. Wait. No, nope, keep going. There it is. Springfield. Okay. And then uh, Wittenberg. Wittenberg. Yep, I see right it. There. Yep. Zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. Am I close? Oh, there it is. Got it. There's observatory the right there. And the observatory I know is going to be welcoming in the hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> that are going to be coming to this area. And using, is there a bathroom inside? Yeah. Uh, no? <laughs> well, a small fee. Okay, <laughs> that's right, that's right. 
So let's just say you were going to observe from right outside the observatory door right here. So uh, it will tell me what's going to happen. Uh, the essential part that I want to know is up at the top. Total solar eclipse time, 2 minutes 38 seconds. Very respectable. That is a very good score. 2 minutes 38 seconds is not bad at all. The closer you are to the edge, the less it is. So if you're right at the edge of the eclipse there, it's just one second. But it does go up pretty quickly. But then if you go to the center line, let's say you go up to, uh, well, let's see, where was, uh, there's Dayton. Dayton's a little bit worse off than you are. Well, no, 246. Try, so it's a little bit better. Try but, Indianapolis. Well, yeah, so yeah, I'm just trying to go up 75. Oh. Like Sydney is three minutes 53. Wapakoneta, three minutes 56. Center line, four minutes. Not even that, 357. So Indiana is a little longer. The farther south you are, a little bit longer. Uh, so down here, it's about four minutes one. And Texas would be, and, and Mexico would be the, the longest, but not by much. So you don't have to be right on the center line. Could you check Cleveland? Somebody told me yesterday Cleveland is really good. Cleveland's real close, and whether Cleveland is better than anywhere else in Ohio on April 8th. So downtown, 3 minutes 48 seconds. Mm. Not too shabby. The Guardians uh, baseball team has a game. They have postponed it or moved it back later in the day. It was going to be during the eclipse <laughs> of totality. And now they put it in the afternoon, but uh, yeah. That would, be, that would be ominous as somebody's winding up for the pitch. And then, <laughs> the lights on. Yeah. So, yeah, but you don't have to be right on the center line. Like, that's what the big misconception is. Like, you, you want to be there for maximum amount. Like, if you're within 10 or 15 miles of that, you're, you're only going to lose a few seconds. It's not a big drop off until you get closer to the very far edge. So... I think anything above three minutes, in my mind, I, I want to go three minute 30 or more, uh, but even two and a half is fine, one and a half is fine, it's just the most thing, important thing is to see something, but you don't, uh, don't want to be close to the edge, and that's one thing for uh, Cincinnatians, is that the media is really on this thing that you could go to this little town of Harrison, it's the only town in, in our county that's in totality, uh, and you get uh, you know, a minute 30, which is not too shabby, but imagine one million people going to Harrison because <laughs> they want to get one minute 30. So, so that's, that's the options. You have lots of places to go. Now, uh, folks that maybe remember the other one from 2017, there was the thing like I, it took me three hours to get down to Kentucky, but eight and a half hours to get home. Hmm. The traffic jam that is going to happen that day will be like nothing you've ever seen over the entire region because literally millions of people are going to come into this path from other places. Chicagoans are going to come down towards Indianapolis and everybody from the east is going to come this way. And so this is going to be a crazy day. Now that means you can cash in. <laughs> this is great. Rent out a spare room, charge for some parking in your neighborhood, have eclipse glasses ready for all these rubes from Cincinnati that didn't prepare, <laughs> and get their glasses, and you say, oh, where are you from? Cincinnati? 50 bucks a pair. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to do it. You got to take advantage of those Cincinnatians. And so it's going to be a, quite a day. So my, a lot of people were asking, so what, are, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I don't know. I'm not going to be clouded out. So that much I know. So that means I'm going to have to watch the weather and decide that week. I can't decide ahead of time. I love all the weather prediction sites that are out there that are trying to give you the ideas of what it's going to be like on April 8th. And I saw this one. This is my favorite one. It said... Will it be clear where you are on April 8th? Answer, maybe. <laughs> I was like, at least they're honest. Nobody knows what it's going to be like. There is the trends from the last 100 years, but the trends from the last 100 years are not really necessarily accurate. 
in the last 10 years. We just got over the clearest February ever. February in Cincinnati is atrociously miserable and depressing, and I wasn't depressed at all. <laughs> it was so sunny and so clear. We had more clear nights in February ever. What's April gonna do? Who knows? But I don't wanna pin myself down to one place. There's some places that have actually asked, they like, hey, there's this uh, place in Texas that asked if I'd come and be their MC, and I said, no, I can't do it. I can't promise to be down there. And uh, TV stations from Cincinnati, they're like, where are you gonna be? We wanna go where you're gonna go. I was like, you can't follow me. <laughs> I'm gonna, my range is Arkansas to Buffalo. That's my range. And I bet I can be talked into moving it down here. So you gotta watch the weather to figure out where the clear skies are gonna go. And you really can only tell a few days out. So my plan is about five days out, get the general idea of which direction I probably wanna go, north, west, or south, and then two days out, decide. If you do have to go far, my other advice is you don't have to stay the night in the path. You can always stay just outside the path in a hotel, drive in that day. Driving in is not gonna be a problem. Driving out is gonna be a problem. And so uh, my plan is, let's say I end up in Conway, Arkansas somehow. Uh, I'll probably stay around Memphis, drive in, and then drive back out and stay the night outside the path and let the traffic clear up. That's my plan. But I'm hoping I just come on up here to Springfield and uh, Dan gives me a parking spot. You can, Bath you can stay at my house. <laughs> stay at bathroom access, yep. that's very important wherever you go eclipse chasing. Um, you know, so you know, it, depend it all depends on what the weather's gonna be. Mm. But it is definitely worth it to plan ahead. Um, so as far as equipment goes, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing all right, doing good, okay. Um, so as far as equipment goes, definitely glasses are uh, essential to get these Eclipse glasses because you need these for the partial stages, that, that part where it's just uh, growing as time goes. And it is cool to watch the partial stages. You probably have heard about the pinhole method, the uh, projection method. This is like the old school method of how people uh, looked at it back in the day. And the idea is you put a pinhole in a piece of paper and you let the sunlight come down and you watch the sun on the ground. It's kind of lame. I don't really like it that much. I don't recommend it because you know what I'm really worried about people doing? Pinhole piece of paper, look through the hole at the sun. Mm -hmm. I'm really worried people do that. They do. Because they think, oh, it's just a little hole. What's that gonna do? Yep. Burn out a little hole in your retina. That's what it's gonna do. So I don't like the pinhole method. You can do it in a variety of ways. And I do have, uh, let's see, I'll show you some of my examples of some other Eclipse viewing. Yeah, so this is the pinhole method. It's, I don't know, it's okay. You can make your own pinhole camera with your body. So this is just a fist like this. The sunlight coming through the fist comes down as a crescent during the eclipse. You can interlace your fingers and make pinhole projections, and they come down as little crescents. Light coming through the leaves make little crescents during the eclipse. A lot of people saw this in 2017. You can do it with a Ritz cracker. <laughs> Anything with a hole, it'll work. But just that whole, let's put a box over our head and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, <laughs> I gotta tell you, I just gave a talk this afternoon down um, in, in uh, Warren County, and one of the people said, you know, back in the 60s, we had this thing where they had smoked glass, and they made us look down into a pool of water to see, look at the smoked glass, look at the pool of water, the reflection of the sun in the water. And I was like, Wait, was this in the 1860s? What was this? <laughs> and that is what they did back in the turn of the century. They would look at the, in the water, they would reflect it into the water and watch the water for the eclipse. And I was like, you did that when you were a child in the 1960s? I'm like, oh my gosh. It, so I, I guess it did happen, but you don't need to do that. We, we, we have glasses. The glasses can work. Um, so now the things with the glasses, uh, is there's a couple different styles on these. There's the old ones and the new ones. If you have the old ones from 2017, they are probably okay. 
uh, but they do degrade over time. So you want to check them out. You want to get a really bright flashlight, shine them through there, look for any weak spots, holes, creases, because they could be bad. They probably aren't, but they could be, so you want to test them out ahead of time. Um, so the, the two main types there are, are the flat black front ones. These are the old school ones, and then the new ones have a shiny front. And it was all because, uh, I assume, they, the flat black ones were just fine. We used them all through all of the 20th century and all that stuff. Um, uh, but these ones with the shiny front are way darker than those other ones. So I assume lawyers got involved and were like, let's make them darker. And so they are darker, but the flat black ones can work. What you want to look for on the back, there's a symbol on the back called ISO. That tells you that they're legit ones if there's an ISO symbol. So I'll have these up at the front. You can check these out. And uh, oh yeah, by the way, I'm selling these too. So. Uh, yeah, it's come see me if you want to see some, if you want to get some. Um, but yeah, this is a good way to do it. Um, yeah, four bucks, pretty, pretty inexpensive that you can get these somewhere between yeah, three and five dollars, depending on where you get them. But good way to do it. Now, if you have a telescope, uh, I wish we had a telescope I could show, but there's something called a sun funnel. This is a really cool way to do it with, if you don't have a filter for your telescope. So you let the sunlight come through your normal telescope have your eyepiece in there, and then attach this funnel here, which will project an image onto a screen. It works really good. And a lot of people can see this at once. You can watch the progression of the eclipse. It's pretty cool. <coughs> so you just have to look up instructions for sun funnel if you have a telescope. I'd highly recommend it. That's just a funnel from AutoZone. Uh, oh, yeah. There it is, there's mine. So you get a certain auto zone fun funnel, cut it off, and I put shower curtain material on the top. You see right through it, you can see the eclipse. It's great. What'd that cost? Seven bucks, something like that. So then there's filters that go on the end of the telescopes that you can use to block the light before they get into the telescope. Um, these are gonna be hard to get nowadays because they're probably all sold out but make sure you block the light before it gets into the telescope. So out of the two options, I like the funnel way better than putting my eye up to a telescope. So this is a filter, uh, kind of a cheap one, but still works really good, about 20 bucks. And you can put this on a camera also. So if you're taking pictures, oh, that was good. If you're taking pictures, then you can put the filter on the front of the camera uh, and take pictures through the filter. You can do that with your phone and these. So put this in front of your phone camera, you can take a picture of the sun through these also. Yeah, and then this guy had this welder <laughs> helmet. Ah, it was so sad, because he had the greatest camera with the t worst filter. So if you hear about welding glasses, there you can use a certain shade of welding glass to look at the sun. It's number 14 is the shade, and that is the darkest that you can get. So hardly anybody has them. So if you have welders in your family or people like, I got welder's glass, they probably don't have the right welder's glass. Uh, when, I buy my, when I first bought my welder's glass, we had a welding supply store in Cincinnati, and I go up there and I'm like, yeah, I need some number 14. And the owner like looks at me and he's like, <laughs> what are you going to do? Look at the sun? I was like, yeah. I was like, I don't look like a welder. He's like, no. <laughs> so uh, welder's glasses are, they, I used to like them a lot better, but I'm kind of warming up to these glasses. Uh, back in 2017, you couldn't get any welder's glasses in Southwest Ohio because I bought them all. This time I didn't buy them all, so you could still maybe get some, but they're kind of hard to get. But taking a picture through welder's glass, bad idea. Welder's glasses are very, they have a lot of flaws that show up when you magnify. So uh, pictures through the glasses are better than pictures through the welder's glass. So, and this is the adapter that I use for my phone. So uh, you get these for about 20 bucks on Amazon and Orion, uh, the website company. Uh, and so these just go right on top of your telescope. You add the phone in there and you can take a lot of pictures. It's really a great way to do it and pretty inexpensive. So that's, that's my equipment for the next eclipse is that. And then you so see you get some pictures of the sun in white light. 
with the with the, the sunspots and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't take a lot of equipment to do. But I know so many people are going to be taking pictures of this. You're going to be tempted to want to do it. But I would give you that advice is don't waste a lot of time taking pictures. Just really take it all in with your eyes. Because when it's totality, you take the glasses off, you can stare right at it, and behold that for the few minutes so you can see it. And that's what I recommend. And then, then uh, yeah, other people have better pictures. And I'll just borrow theirs. Because you want to have that memory. Because actually, this is the one case where the pictures of the event are not even close to your memories of the event. They are, your memories are so much better than even the pictures that you'll see. So, all right. Well, do we have some time for a few questions? It's still cloudy outside, I assume? It is. It's completely socked in. Good. That means if it's cloudy, I get to talk longer. I can pass along That's... a question oh, yeah, these two gentlemen had. They had heard from someone that welding glasses, and I didn't know the answer to this, uh, blocks visual quite well, but not ultraviolet, which can cause some damage. The only thing I could tell them was I used welder's glasses as a child for many, many times looking at the sun, and that, to my eyesight is some semi-normal. Have you ever heard that, that ultraviolet is passed through the pass band? I have not heard that with the welder's glass. I do have welder's glass up here too. Um, and you can kind of see, so somebody made a frame for me, that helps too. Um, they, I have not heard that that's what happened, so I I'm not sure. I, I looked on the web and it did seem to me like the only part it was designed to pass a little bit was green light mm -hmm. so the welder could keep track of his or her bead yeah. as they went across. But this idea of ultraviolet is something you have to be careful of because that's, you could damage if it's on a camera. Well, as you heard, the, the uniformity of the glass may, may not make that the best choice for a camera anyway. But uh, I would be careful with ultraviolet until we see a pass. They, they make a chart that shows how much light comes through at each wavelength or frequency of light. And if there's a hole where ultraviolet comes through, we should be weary of it. Well, great. Now you got me all worried. Yeah, I know. I thought the same thing. I've looked through this glass for like five hours. <laughs> if I add it all up, all the hours I've looked through this? That's exactly what I thought. Oh, well, that's troubling. Okay, yeah. well, yeah, let's go with the other glasses. Yeah, these, this is what those other glasses are made for. Uh, I'd say go with that. All right, other questions, other questions. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have to be in a, like a meadow or something that doesn't have any trees around? Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Do you have to be like in a clearing, like are you know, trees going to get in the way? Not so much when the totality is happening, at least around here, the sun's going to be uh, about ha over halfway up in the sky. So a little bit under 50 degrees up in the sky it'll be. So as long as you can see halfway up, you're all right. Uh, the other thing you got to look out for is, you know, buildings, of course, but uh, this is going to be in the southwestern sky. So just think about halfway up in the southwestern sky, you can scope out your location for this. Uh, but the other thing that you might not think about is street lights and lights that are ah. sensitive to the dark, because when it gets dark enough, the automatic lights will start turning on. Right. And so if you're under a street light and you're like, okay, it's getting darker, and then the street light comes on right there, you're like, oh man, ah. So just watch out for lights, because they will turn on once it gets darker. Hmm. Yes? Um, today, of course, we use computers to predict these. How far back in history have astronomers been able to accurately predict when an eclipse is going to occur? So, uh, how, like, like us looking back or them or them? So, the question is, like, how far back, how far back can we go to? say there were eclipses or how far back could they say eclipses were going to happen? The second one. That's hard to tell exactly, but it seems like Babylon, the Babylonians were the first to be able to figure out this pattern. Uh, so we're talking you know, 3,000 ish years ago where they could have some accurate measurements and they passed this on to like the ancient Greeks and the Egyptians. Uh, so they kind of borrowed it from them, but then separately, uh, then people in the New World, like Aztec and, and uh, Mayans, could predict it reasonably well also. So it was kind of this, this pastime that people would figure this out. And I was kind of, uh, I was talking to a historian about this, 
uh, because it is so fine to know the, the pattern of eclipses is really complicated. And, uh, but what uh, one of the historians said to me was that, so when in, in ancient, uh, in the Yucatan and the Maya culture, they, the way they predicted eclipses were like, okay, every, about every 177 days there's an eclipse somewhere. It might not be there. It might be somewhere else. But almost every 177 days you might have an eclipse or they'll just miss and not quite be eclipsed. So the way that the Maya did it was they would say, today, don't panic if there's an eclipse, <laughs> basically. So they would say, this is, there's a chance there's an eclipse today, just like we say there's a chance of rain. They would say there's a chance of an eclipse today. And if it didn't happen, it might have happened in a different part of the world, or maybe it just missed. So they weren't, as a, they weren't nearly as accurate as we are now, um, but they could at least sense this pattern. And so that's the general rules about every 177 days. That's the simple pattern that they've probably figured out, that they would chart these solar eclipses and then count how many days between eclipses, and they'd say 177, oops, skipped, 177, 177, skip, 177, something like that. That's the easiest way. But the Babylonians figured out a little bit better than that. Other questions, other questions. Yeah? What's the effect of being at altitude, like on a jet plane at you know, 35,000 feet? What's it look like from their perspective? Ooh, that's a good question. Let's say you want to fly with the eclipse. So the atmosphere, uh, it's not gonna, you know, your visually will look the same. You're not gonna, you know, our atmosphere is not gonna mess that much with, with it compared to being in a plane. Um, flying in a plane with it presents a lot of problems because, uh, well, they, the, I just heard Delta is doing a flight from Austin to Detroit hmm. during the eclipse on purpose. Wow. So they're going to fly with the eclipse shadow to get, you know, a little extra time with the shadow. If you're flying with the shadow, you get it. Sounds good, doesn't it? Shadow is going like 1,800 miles an hour. <laughs> You're going to maybe, I, I was trying to think, I think at, at the slowest it's 1,800. I think in real, I think at that point it's going to be over 2,000 miles an hour. So your shadow is moving way faster than your plane is. And so if you fly with it in a plane, you're going to get a couple extra seconds. That's about it. You can't keep up with it, not even close. Not even the astronauts in the space station can keep up with it. And so... Yeah, flying, man, imagine if you book that ticket and you're on the wrong side of the plane. <laughs> and plus, it's gonna be up here. So you're gonna be like, I, I, and then if you're in the aisle seat, you're like, move, I can't, what? I can't. That's a terrible idea. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, being in a plane, I don't, know, I don't know how they're gonna do that. That's gonna be tough. Um, yeah, because they're going to have to like dip the wing and then only half of the people will be able to see it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. Um, the last eclipse that I missed because of clouds was uh, I think in 2011. I think I'm on a streak of about 15, 16 lunar solar eclipses without being clouded out in a row. The last one I got clouded out was in December in Cincinnati, and December in Cincinnati is our cloudiest month, and I was prepared for this, so I was hanging around the local airport. Uh, we have this little uh, regional airport called Lunkin Airport, and I was like, you know, asking around, was like, is there a pilot that would take me up above the clouds if it was cloudy for this lunar eclipse? And I found one that would do it, and I was like, yes. So, day of the eclipse, cloudy, of course, Snowstorm, of course. And so I called him up and I was like, so uh, when are we going up? And he's like, Dean, didn't you see my plane? I was like, yeah, I saw it. He's like, it's the same plane Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper went down. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but when are we going up? <laughs> and I was like, I, I got you, I understand. On a snowy day. <laughs> So that was the last one I missed. So yeah, I think I'm on 15 or 16 in a row that I've been clouded out. So I got a system. So 
All right, other questions, other questions. Yeah, back in the back. Uh, the sun is particularly stormy at this time. How is that possibly going to affect the eclipse? Yeah, so with the sun's activity, the solar activity is really ramping up because uh, we're close to solar maximum. So that means that the chances of seeing some prominences naked eye go way up, that you see something big enough. So it's got to be something about two or three Earths high to be able to see with the naked eye. Um, so that's definitely possible. The other thing is that the corona should be a little more active also, that it could be more extensive because of all the solar activity. Uh, other than that, uh, I, although I haven't really heard a lot of solar max with corona correlation, but um, it's, a, it's really just the prominences idea that you're going to be looking for. And at the partial stages, you can see the sunspots also. So there might be added sunspots to make it kind of nice as well. Other questions? Yes? So on the off chance that it's not perfectly sunny in Springfield, <laughs> um, how much is the experience diminished by cloud cover? How much is the experience diminished by cloud cover? Completely. Clouds will ruin the whole thing. If it's a day like today, you're going to see nothing. And people do ask, they say, well, all right, so if it's cloudy and the totality happens, is it going to be dark outside? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't care. I'm not thinking about that. Sorry, I'm very selfish. Uh, I assume it'll be darker, but I've never seen a, a total, I've never been clouded out for a total solar eclipse. So I don't know what it's going to be like, but you won't see the sun. So. The one little thing is if it's partly cloudy, that's the most nerve wracking one because you have this chance that it's gonna be clear. And closer to totality, the clouds do tend to diminish a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. And so uh, because the heat goes down and then the clouds will dissipate a little bit. But if it was a day like today, we'd be in big, we'd not, we wouldn't see anything. So, yeah. I know, it's making me nervous thinking about it. <laughs> other questions, other questions. Yeah? I heard there's a possible chance we'll be able to see a comet. Yeah, um, hmm. yeah, there's been a lot of news about this. There's a comet coming around that could be visible in the sky at that time. I check that out and I don't know what they're talking about this comet so comets tend to be overhyped in the media and, uh, and astronomers are a little bit to blame to this that they say that a comet is going to be this magnitude or this brightness up in the sky but a comet brightness is different than a star brightness and so a, a star that would be that bright would be visible in the naked eye but the comet it will not and chances are it will not, unless it brightens unexpectedly. Uh, but also it's going to be in a weird spot in the sky to not be able to see very clearly. So that, that comet plus eclipse thing, I, I don't think that's going to... I know they're hyping that up, uh, but I'm not holding my breath. And besides, I, I want to see the eclipse anyway, so I'm not going to be like, where's that comet? No, I'm not, I'm not going to waste a second on that comet. <laughs> that's for sure. But I do hear it's going around. And I, I looked it out, and I, it just doesn't make sense that you're going to be able to see it with naked eye at all. But, yeah. There are a couple of planets. Yeah, planets will be up there, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, I can, well, uh, we can do this later, but I have a simulation where you can see what it's going to be like also. Other questions, other questions. Yeah, back in the back. How do you know when it is totality? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, so, I, boy, I'm trying to think. I mean, it was great that I had David Levy to tell me when to look. Uh, the last one, uh, I, when I was in that field in Kentucky, there was about 50 other people there, and then it suddenly occurred to me that I'm the one that's gonna have to tell them when to look. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want this responsibility. <laughs> and, um, it, it, I, w I was a little late on this one uh, because you can kind of judge it down the last second. So basically you have the welders or the, you have the glasses and you're looking at it and you'll see just one little sliver showing. And when it's down to like a little pinpoint, that's when you take the glasses off and take a look. So uh, I remember, 
you know, Dave and Levy did such a great job. What I did was we were out in this field and I was looking up at, I was looking at the glasses and I was like, okay, it's about right, it's about right, about right. And I kind of took the glasses down to let my eyes look at the ground first and then look back up and I like, I got the choke in my throat and everybody's like waiting for me and I'm like, uh, uh, look, just look, look. <laughs> That's all I could say is look. So you can use the map to give you at least a little bit of a sense of exactly timing. And so when you click on any spot, it'll tell you that the time in universal time, which means you just subtract four hours from this. So totality around here is going to be about 310. Right. So 310 is a good chance. So this says 310 and 13 seconds. So I'd say, yeah, have your alarm set for 310. Wait five seconds. Wait. 13 seconds or early if you want to go early and then uh yeah look for that one thing i've been telling people is if you see nothing through your eclipse glasses it's time to take them off yeah. okay if you're looking at the sun through your eclipse glasses and suddenly you can't see it at all that's time to take them off yeah yeah very good advice yeah i think that's a good way to do it yeah plus if you're here uh, dan will tell you when yeah, we're going to have an air horn. If you're here, we're going to have an air horn. It's going to right. go off. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Air horn. Oh, yeah. All right. Other questions? Other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. What is the oval on the map? So the oval, this oval, yes. that's the shape of the shadow. So, yeah, this is the shape of the shadow as it's going across because you got the relatively round moon, but the shadow coming down on a curved earth. And uh, yeah, so that's the, the shape of that. So the center, you get darker, the edge or edges, you don't. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So you start wearing the glasses when the partial starts, is yep. that? So yes, or before. <laughs> well, right, yeah, and before, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you can do that. Uh, well, let's see. All right. You guys don't mind another two minutes, do you? All right. Here's my simulation of that day with my very ancient sky simulation program. Uh, and so this is outside on April 8th uh, from Cincinnati. Here's the sun. Zoom in. Oh, all right. Eclipse already started. Whoops. Okay. Let's go back an hour. There we go. So, uh, normal day, normal sun, and then each time I'm clicking is one minute. So this is 1.30, 1.35. The partial stage in Cincinnati and around here will be very similar, just maybe a smidgen later. 1.52, you'll start to see the, the moon take a bite. So that's the first contact. And so yeah, glasses on through this whole time. So here's about 2.30, about halfway blocked. 245 here, 250, and three o'clock is when stuff will really start getting real. It'll start getting a little darker, a little shade darker. You'll feel the temperature being a little bit more uh, cooler. And then here's every minute, 301, 302, 303, 304, 305, 306, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is Cincinnati. Oh. 11, 12, 13. Oh. So close. But that 1% is still going to be significantly bright enough that you need the glasses for that. So even 1% is showing. So when you're down to like a quarter percent, then you might have a chance. But like Dan said, if you're looking up at the glasses and you can't see anything, it's probably okay to do it. But yeah. So this is what I'm trying to tell people in Cincinnati. Get out of the city. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> ah, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fun trying to convince people to get out of town. They're like, well, I'll just see 99%. I'm like, yeah, that's tough. Well, you can buy my glasses, though, that's for sure. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> so well, what we'll do is I'll hang around. If you have some questions, um, and then if you want to see some of the books and get some glasses, come up and see me up here. Um, but, uh, and if you want to find out a little bit more, uh, you can follow me on my website and uh, I'm on all social media platforms. So if you're wanting to know where I'm going, 
I am not going to make it a secret. I will be watching the weather, and that week I'll be posting my probabilities, and then probably April 6th we'll make my decision and say where I'm going, where I think it will be clear skies. So if you want to follow along uh, and meet me out there with, I don't know, however any other people are going to be out there, uh, I'll get the air horn and everything will get it all kicked off and going. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for Thanks. coming tonight. Thank you for your uh, interest in this. This is going to be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. So as I said, we are not going to do any observing.